Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to the Cool Kids Lunch Table Podcast with PJ and Mike. Now, please find yourself a seat at their table. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Cool Kids Lunch Table Podcast with PJ and Mike. As always, I'm one half of the Cool Kids, PJ. And I'm Mike. And today we have a special guest with us that's going to be uh, helping us talk about some movies. We'll be talking about if modern movies suck. We'll be talking about well-written movies, some bad-written movies. Uh, we're going to even talk a little bit about the actor strike and the writer strike. Uh, so Mike is going to introduce our guest for us. Yeah, yeah. So guys, to help us out, we have Kirby Taylor. Uh, she's from she's a Minneapolis-based writer and creator with four complete feature-length scripts and plenty more original works on the way. She loves all things movies. Her favorite things are a bucket of popcorn and her dog Remy. For the movie and meme lovers, check out her. Uh, C- cinema, cine- oh man, scene, scene centric. That's all, folks. Uh, Instagram at popcorny movies. Uh, and stop, say popcorny friends. So, Kirby, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. We thank really you. appreciate it. We're happy to have you on here. Cinecentric. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, That's a made my up old, word. My special ed's kicking in. Sorry. <laughs> all are welcome. All are welcome. Uh, Hey, cool kids. I'm Kirby. Thank you for inviting me to sit at your cool kids table. Usually I eat lunch alone with the librarian, so appreciate it. Well, there's always room at the cool kids lunch table for a librarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And everyone's welcome at the table. As long as you can be yourself, that's all. That's what it's all about. But um, yeah, we're very happy to have you on here. And uh, we always start off with a childhood memory. So, Kirby, we're going to start with you. What made what movie made you want to make movies or write movies, you know? Yeah, and it's it's hard to remember one. I think as you go backwards, you kind of just lump everything together. But I do remember as a kid just loving the magic of Disney films. Mm. You know, I would run around the house with a basket and a book in it and pretend I was Belle. Hey. Bonjour. 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 Like plenty of songs were sung, so. You know, it wasn't necessarily, yes, I'm going to make the next Little Mermaid, but it was something about just the magic of these films and and how they really encompassed my childhood. So that feeling was kind of always there as a kid. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, what it was is Belle your favorite Disney princess? <laughs> I'm technically an Ariel. Um, no, okay. I, I don't have a favorite. I think when you start choosing favorites, it just goes downhill. But I mean, <laughs> my favorites are always going to be the random sidekicks like uh, Timon and Pumbaa or something. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm also a big Disney kid. Um, uh, I grew up on all those movies. Also, I go to the parks all the time. I, I love me yeah. some Disney. Yes. I'll see you there. I go, we we used to go once or twice a year to all the different oh, parks. Wow. Yeah, we have um, we did Disneyland Paris a few years back. That was pretty cool to see that. I, I want to try and hit all the parks. That's one of my bucket lists is yeah. to hit all the parks. So I'm a big Disney kid, so I hear you on that. Amazing. Yeah, is that one of your earlier movie memories too, is Disney, or was it something else? My earlier movie memories, definitely a lot of Disney, um, because, I, I mean, I, like I said, I love it. And as a kid, you can't not watch those cartoons and just – be enthralled like you said it's their magic right um mm-hmm. and then i'm a when you when you see all those movies but then you get to go to the parks and you go through the, the dark rides and it's like being in the movie it's just an, an even different experience although the the first movie i remember seeing that made me want to make movies was uh was not a disney movie the movie that made me mm-hmm. want to make movies and write movies is clerks which is probably the furthest thing from a Disney movie. Yeah. Um, but that's the movie I saw. I was older, obviously, um, when I saw that. But that's the movie that's like, man, this is this is sounds like me. Like they're talking about comic books. They're talking about Star Wars. They're talking about all this stuff that I love. It was like a movie made for me. They're they're cursing the way I curse. And that's the mo- movie that made me think I could do this. I could I can create some sort of content. Um, so that's the first movie that really got me into the idea of filmmaking. But the first movies I saw and loved that wanted that made me want to keep watching movies are definitely Disney movies, and then like your Batman eighty nines and your, your superhero movies. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm on the same page with PJ. 
with all of those. I think for mine, I think I, I think in the past, PJ, we spoke about this. I talked about Terminator 2, but I yep. think I'm just thinking about it even now. I was saying, um, I think even Roger Rabbit, I think, you know, because like you think about the beginning when Roger, you know, you know, maybe hopefully this isn't a spoiler, but the beginning, it's like a cartoon and it, took, it takes you into the real world, you know? And that's like the first time I guess that I saw a movie where there was like a behind the scenes, you know, as a kid, I actually thought he was real. But um, I was like, isn't oh, that a Disney movie? movie? Yeah, Disney. Yeah. And I think it's like a yeah, Amblin. Yeah, it's Amblin. A crossover event. Touchstone. Right, Touchstone. Right? Touchstone. That's what it is. Touchstone. So, yeah. um, mm-hmm. which is like a, I guess they're off brand because they want more adult films, you know. Off Broadway. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, nice. So Kirby, I'm just kind of curious because, you know, like my brother and I r- r- wrote some movies and like, guess for you, who's like done, you know, look, we're my brother and I, you know, we're kind of, you know. The, uh, the ghetto version, you know, we're doing it like street time, you know, <laughs> you know, copy paste kind of thing. And, you know, trying to, you know, you know, when we you know, early 2000s, we were trying to do this. So I'm curious for you, who's someone who's really who is a screenwriter who's written complete things. I guess. How did, how did you, you know, how did you get started with this? Did you read books? Did you, you know, I don't know. You have a mentor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not classically trained either. <laughs> you know, I didn't go right, to right. a symphony <laughs> or, or school for writing. Um, I can't remember a creative writing class. It was, it was, it was more uh, actually that I wanted to act. You know, I have a theater minor from college and I was in theater growing up quite a lot. You know, I've always kind of been a ham. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close up. So I thought the that the acting route would be the way that I, I got into movies. And, you know, that really switched when and it, it really didn't dawn on me until literally mid COVID mm. that I could write down the stories that I had been telling myself in my head. You know, I'm always just kind of doing too many things at once <laughs> in my brain. Um, and. So I just finally decided one day, like, hey, what would this look like in a script? Um, So started really, really basic and and sketchy and just put everything on paper. And then, yeah, I just found a lot of books, a lot of online resources to get the templating right. You know, that's a really difficult part. And it just went from there. And, you know, now now that I've opened that doorway it doesn't really stop. Like I even have dreams in screenplay where I stop in my dream and go, you should wake up and write this down because it's going to be a great film. Wow. <laughs> and then it's of course not, it's not, you know, you wake up and you read your notes and it's like lizard president from Mars. I don't know. It's just like nonsensical dream thought. But uh, my first screenplay was based on a dream sequence that I had. So sometimes it's just like these clear visuals that pop into my head and then I just write them down and then I try to connect them. And it's interesting because Taika Waititi, who's one of my favorite writer directors, he mm. has said that he does something similar, you know, start with the big pieces, the big scenes, get those on paper and then make the connections from there. So that's the way I go about it. Like I said, not classically trained, you know, writing doesn't look like like one thing to everybody, you know, start where you're at and then go from there. I I went to film school for a while. And um, one of the things that I remember, you know, learning and it's something that kind of stuck with me and it kind of goes back a little bit to what Mike was saying, how when him and his brother were making movies and stuff, they were kind of doing it on the fly and, and doing it their own way. But I I always like when I was first getting into movies and trying to learn how to write, have these big and I'm a big comic book nerd, right? So I'd write these big elaborate things of like superheroes and explosions and battles in the sky, right? And then, you know, you think maybe I'll make an indie movie and you very quickly realize mm-hmm. I can't make this movie. <laughs> I can't do it. How am I supposed to I can't make somebody fly? <laughs> um and then I started learning like when I write, I have to write towards what I can do. Mm. And that's another reason why, like Clerks, you know, to go back to that, yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. because he wrote a movie he could make on his own because he filmed it in a convenience store that he worked in. Right. But that was something that really stuck with me when I started going to film school and I started realizing, oh, I can't make a, a movie with a giant dinosaur in it, um, but I can make something <laughs> local, you know, where yeah. I have access to yeah. it. And that's just something that really stuck with me. And another reason why that movie is a movie that when I think about influences, because he was smart enough to create something that only he could make, that he could afford to make, that he could do. And I just think that's a smart way of writing. 
Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I'm in Minneapolis. It's, it's not easy to make the connections you need to bring, you know, script to screen. So I'm actually starting a play. You know, I thought maybe start with a play, something that you could put on locally, you know, low budget, you know, two person on a stage play. And maybe that's an entry into the writing world, you know, start small, start with something that you can control and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's a great idea. But since we're talking about, uh, all the writing of movies, we should just jump right into our first topic, I think, for the day, which is <laughs> yeah. to talk about some movies that we think are the best written movies. Um, so I have a few on my list, but we'll let our, our guests go first. So Kirby, what do you think of some uh, really good, well-written movies? Yeah, so for me, the best scripts, and I think they're the most difficult to write, are the ones that have surprise ending so a twist mm -hmm. ending for me is bread and butter like I wish I could write like that I try to write like that but the sixth sense yeah is mm -hmm. one of the best written scripts I think of the modern age just to to lead you down a road and then completely switch it on you and then to watch it three more times and find more nuances uh, primal fear is another great one where you have that twist ending um, I think it's hard to surprise modern audiences. You know, we're skeptics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of things, uh, good and bad. And so I just love a script that comes in and turns you on your head. And then I also just love scripts that are ballsy, right? Like Jojo Rabbit, which is a Taika Waititi again. Uh, Great movie. Can you can you imagine pitching that, you guys? Like, yeah, yeah, it's just so off the wall. So off the wall. Like, okay, a kid in Nazi Germany has a best friend, they do everything together. Also it's Hitler and it's a child understanding of Hitler. And then we see the war through his eyes. Like, and it was so successful, but I just cannot imagine <laughs> pitching that film. Yeah. It's just I, ballsy. I think that movie only got made because it was him. I don't know that <laughs> other directors could have made a movie sure. that, would, that wouldn't just be the most offensive thing to the, all the audiences. I think because of, of his quirkiness and his style, yeah he's able to make that movie and pull it off because mm -hmm. other people I don't think could, but that movie is, I agree with you. That's a fantastic movie. Very well written, very entertaining, mm -hmm. very thoughtful too. In certain areas, a great, great, great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughtful humor, I think is pretty difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How about you guys? What are you, what's your list? Um, I have, um, this isn't any particular order. I mean, some of these are based off books, but I have Shawshank Redemption Mm -hmm. I have uh, No Country for Old Men. I have Memento, Annie Hall, uh, The Social Network. I guess more of the, uh, I guess those are like your, you know, Pulp Fiction. Those are like people always talk about. But I always like Sideways. You remember that? With um, yes. yeah. Paul Giamatti. That's a great Paul movie. Paul Giamatti. Sideways is a great movie. Very, very underrated, I think. It didn't get mm -hmm. the love it should have got. Yep. Mm -hmm. I also have here, I think it's a great, I think it's a great film. I think it should have won Best Picture. Uh, Brokeback Mountain. That's a great mm -hmm. movie. That movie's, you know. I know some people like the 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 context of it, but it's a freaking great movie. Everything. I mean, he won Best Director for that yeah. movie. You know, on fire, man. That movie's damn good. You know. Um, That's I even have. Yep, even have Seven on here. Oh, uh, what's in the box? Uh, me what's the in the fucking box? Um, and Reservoir Dogs. And you can go on and on. But I actually okay. later on I have a question. Uh, I, I want to ask Kirby, but not not yet. I want after DJ. I want to hear yours. <laughs> I I have an eclectic. Um, list of movies here that don't necessarily all fit together but when i think of movies that were written very well um these are the first things that came to mind i did no research on what i thought on what the world thinks are best written movies i just yeah in my head yeah and uh the first movie that i thought of when i was thinking about really well written movies was the princess bride yes uh, that i oh, mean it's great. quotable for days right oh, okay. you know oh, but okay. the the story in it it has comedy it has a little bit of action. It has some romance. It, it just has adventure to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a it's set in a, a different period, and it, it's visually they have things that are worth looking at, but just funny mm -hmm. gags too visually. Like when you really just sit down and watch it, and like I said, quotable forever. I mean, they're just such great dialogue in that movie. You know, uh, I I think that and I, and it's rewatchable. I think a well written movie should be something oh, you yeah. want to watch again. Because if, mm -hmm. if it's well-written, it should be something that sticks with you. And you're like, I need to watch that again. I want to see it again. It's, it doesn't get old. 
And for me, that movie is the epitome of a movie that ages just fantastically and doesn't get old. I also put on here Fight Club. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, that's another movie when you talk about twists mid-movie or mm. things you don't see coming. I mean, if you read the book first, you might know, but, right, you know, right. <laughs> but when you when you read the book or watch the movie and it's the first time you're seeing that story, there are definitely things where you're like, oh, my God, I never expected that was going to be yeah. in there. It's the same guy. But like, it's just, you know, that to me is a well-written movie. And again, rewatchable. Every time I watch that movie, I pick something else up. Um, I put Good Will Hunting on my list. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Ben Affleck doesn't get the credit he deserves as a writer. I've said that mm. for a long time and a director. I don't know how much of Good Will Hunting was him versus Matt Damon. Uh, I think when that movie first came out, everyone thought it was very Matt Damon heavy, the writing. Uh, but I think after seeing what Ben Affleck has done in his later part of his career, it's very possible that he had more to do with the success of that script. Um, going back to Kevin Smith, he was a producer on that movie and he helped, and I'm sure he helped with some of that dialogue. Um, you know, Matt Damon and, and Ben Affleck are part of that whole view askew crew. Yeah, yeah. And that's how, you know, Kevin Smith got that movie produced. It was his pull that helped. And I am sure some of his writing made its way in there to help with that dialogue. But that's, again, there's not really a twist there, but it's just well-written, well-made, a lot of feeling behind it. Uh, Mike mentioned this one already, but Pulp Fiction yeah, you can never say enough good things about Pulp sure. Fiction. Well written, well acted, just fantastic. Quentin's best. And then my last one, I was going to only pick one because I wanted to make a list of five movies, and I couldn't figure out which one of these was better. And they both starred Jim Carrey. Oh, yeah. and I could not figure out which one was the better written film because I think they're both so great. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And The Truman Show. Yes, I, I've never seen oh. mine yet. The Truman Show, I should have, yeah, Peter Weir, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think I could compare them either. They're just such different genres. Such, right, so completely different. I mean, the range it shows that Jim Carrey has as an actor, mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable. And there's, But they're both so well written, I'm like, you know what? I can say both, so I will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you shall, and you shall, yeah. it's your show. Exactly. You know, it's interesting, Mike, listening to your list. You know, a lot of those are adapted from short stories. Yeah, know, yeah, Shawshank yeah, yeah, Redemption yeah. was a, a Stephen King short story yeah. and Brokeback Mountain was too. Um, I have never attempted to take a short story and, you know, elongate that into any kind of long form script. Uh, I almost wonder if it's, if it, is it easier to start from a short story or is it easier to just start from scratch and, and then you can go wherever you like, you know, in, a, in the plot. Yeah, I would I would tend to, for me, I would think something completely original mm. and not basing it off of a story, although you are right. A lot of these really well written movies do start as a book or a short story or something else. Yeah, something to pull from. Yeah, I well, two quick things. Uh, just going back to Princess Bride, I think everything you said was awesome, TJ. I I think people forget that the whole thing with Fred Savage as a kid. Yeah. People forget about that whole part of that movie. Because yep, they always yeah, think absolutely. about all these other funny characters and blah, blah, blah. But that's a really big, <laughs> makes that, what's that movie even magical, you know? Like, and Deadpool spoofed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my question for Kirby is, I'm just curious. So uh, I know we, Pete and I talked about the Star Wars films, but... Um, Oh my God, Ryan Johnson. Okay, he made the last shot. I blah blah blah. But I'm curious about how do you think? What do you think of? I don't know if you saw both of his the Knives Out. Do you like? Because some people break that guy. Look, I know we know Last Shot. I wasn't perfect. Da 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 da. We don't look okay. But <laughs> but Knives Out. I love the first one. Second one's okay. But I'm just curious. What do you think as a? Because you think about twists and all that. That's why I. Sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I because in Knives Out, hopefully this isn't too much a spoiler, but you know the whole time, right? It's this, and I think Alfred Hitchcock had a really similar theory of, you know, there's a bomb under the table and you show the audience the bomb in the beginning, but no one else knows about it. And so you right. just keep going back to it. So I feel like Knives Out did something like that. Mm. And I did not find it as, as appealing as being completely surprised. You know, it felt like we were in the know so early that the actual climax lost its edge. 
uh, I still loved it. I still thought it was excellent, but just with that part of it, you know, the, the twist before a twist, Mm. I just didn't love it as much as the more traditional keep everyone in the dark until it's time to, to take center stage and uh, flip it on its head. But I, I mean, everyone I spoke to disagreed with me uh, and really enjoyed that it was different. So I get, I get both opinions. Well, well, if it makes you feel better, I agree with you. I thought that movie, (laughs) I I thought the movie was a good movie. Don't get me wrong. I I watched it. I was entertained by it, but I wasn't blown away by it by any stretch. I thought there were some interesting parts, you know, it was definitely well acted and all, but I, I don't get necessarily all the hype around it. Ryan Johnson. Well, I won't talk about last Jedi. There's a whole episode. Everyone can go back to and listen to me shit all over that movie. But um, he also did Looper, I think. I don't know if he yeah, wrote yeah, Looper. Yeah. Oh, did, interesting. Did direct or just direct? Yeah, no, you're right. He did. Yeah, yeah no, he wrote it in direct. Yeah, he's. I don't think he's bad. I think he's just. Well, I think I now he's starting to find that's... his footing with Knives Out. I think he's talented for sure. You know, yeah. Looper could be on the list of of really well written movies. Um, more than his other ones, I like Looper a lot. Although I don't know that I really believe that. Um, Joseph Gordon Levitt is a young Bruce Willis by any stretch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that, but I thought the the kind different of, issue. Yeah, <laughs> the premise of that movie I thought was really good, uh, and even in execution it was good. I just I don't see JGL growing up into being uh, Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. Technically, not a script issue. But yeah, fair. right, right, right. <laughs> fair. <laughs> so, so um, of, of issues, okay. I think we're talking about. Uh, I think you were looking to go into bad movies. That's right? what yeah. I was gonna do. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> some of the worst yeah you know i have a i had a hard time with this because i would literally hate for anyone to read my script and say okay this is yeah. one of oh. the worst scripts right. i have ever read right. right right so i i will be as respectful as possible you know i the one I that, <laughs> that... <laughs> fair but you have not read my script so, so yeah go ahead go ahead um uh, the the ones that stick out to me are the ones where the climax, you know, the turn of the narrative are are weak, just doesn't mm-hmm. work for me. So immediately I thought of Batman versus Superman, the whole save Martha yeah. was just I think that would be weak in a script form. You know, you would read that and say, is this enough? You know, is this enough to turn these characters who are trying to kill each other into working for the same side? You know, I did not see that as a good enough reason to to yeah. have this huge movie with all of these you know different characters all of a sudden switch uh so that one comes to mind you know you need to have a strong motivation and a strong climax in order to to move to part three you know and martha just didn't do it for you <laughs> it didn't did it do it for you no no um okay. which is okay. a shame because up until that point of the movie i actually loved that movie uh, okay. Yeah, I'm a, like I said, I'm a big comic book fan, and yeah. there's so much in that movie inspired and drawn directly from comic books. And I was okay. like, wow, this is like a, one of these books that I've read come to life. And then, why did you say that name? And you're like, oh my God, what did we just do? <laughs> and there were so many better ways we could have accomplished the same thing. We, I mean, oh, anything, anything yes. could have done that. I, I mean, we both hate spandex. Anything would have been better. It's but fun. why not just have Superman do something that Batman sees and he's like, wait a minute, this guy, if he was really looking to destroy the Earth, he wouldn't have done the thing he just did. I right. have this wrong. And it could be right. something personal. It could have been like, maybe he does save Alfred or something. Like, there's anything could have happened. They had a, I don't know, there was, they could have used kryptonite and Superman sacrifices himself with some kryptonite to save some humans. And then Batman's mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, if he was trying to take us over, he wouldn't have done this thing. And maybe I have this wrong. I have to, re-. there was a better way to get to the, to the point they got to without our moms have the same name. Right. 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 So I agree with you. That part really flips that movie. I think the rest of the movie holds up and is really great, but that part really, it makes the movie take a sharp turn. It didn't tank the whole production for you. It didn't tank the whole production. It, it tanked from that part of the movie forward. Um, because you can't get that part out of your mind. I think Mm -hmm. up until that point, I think it's, I think the opening of that movie, when you have Bruce Wayne running through Metropolis during the man of steel, I think that was just incredibly smart. 
I, I think there's a lot of good in that movie. I think I think the Martha part sours the movie, but it doesn't kill it for me. Sure. And maybe that's like, as a whole, right, the production can save different elements of a yep. script that maybe are flat. You know, it's, it's a whole production by a whole group. Um, but I bet if we read the script alone, it may not match what you hoped it would be. Right. Very possible. Mm-hmm. PJ, what's on your list, man? I mean, we could go for days on movies I think are bad. Um, <laughs> but I will start with uh, I'll start with signs because we what? said no. yeah. bad PJ, bad. I mean, no, listen. <laughs> Here's my I problem love that movie. with this movie. It's not perfect. I, I love that I movie. I have a problem with the written the writing of the movie. The whole thing is supposed to be about you know, look, it's about the aliens, right? And they're coming to Earth and the whole thing. These are the dumbest bunch of aliens I've ever met in my entire life. Really, they are. You said they were going to be smart. But I mean, if you know you don't, like you're allergic to water, maybe you don't come to the planet that's like 98% water. Like, it's just, I'm like, all right. I mean, that's, and then, oh no, they have evil poison dust. And this guy just happens to get an asthma attack and he can't breathe it in. I'm like, that's just... I'm sorry, that's convenient. Amazing. Right, well, I think that's where it's talking about signs, and it was like destiny and yeah, all that kind of I, stuff, and like the it, spiritual kind of thing, so, and faith, you know? Mm-hmm. It's all the deuce ex machina you can handle. Like, oh, we need a way for him to not breathe. Let's just, he's got an asthma attack. We need a way to beat the aliens. They came to the water planet. Kevin right. Costner lives here on Waterworld. That's where the aliens came. Like, I, I always joke around, like, my favorite crossover movies would have been Signs versus the Titanic. And, like, this is in my mind. Like, my favorite crossover would have been, like, the signs aliens come down. They're trying to take over. The ship lands on the Titanic. And the captain sinks the ship because he knows the water will kill the aliens. And that's why the Titanic sinks. That's my favorite idea for a crossover movie. Okay, I kind of love it. That's I always, I always say, like, if I could, if everyone's, like, when that versus thing became, like, alien versus predator, Batman versus Superman, like, Freddy versus Jason. Jason yeah. Like, what versus movie would I make? I would make Signs Aliens versus the Titanic. That's what I would do. I don't think that that movie was well written. I don't think it's among his best. I know I'm in the minority, but. Um, no, I, I don't think you are at all. I think people either love the village, love signs, you know, are signed up for post Six Sense Shyamalan, or they're not. You know, I feel like that's a, a big thing. I also put on this list to to bring back to the DC universe of it all, uh, Wonder Woman eighty four. Oh yeah, Oof. <laughs> that was awful. Awesome. That Woof. was that's a tough movie to sit through uh, mm-hmm. because there's so much bad about it, <laughs> and then you're like, well, that's just bad on a surface level. But then when right. you really start to think how they turned Wonder Woman into a rapist, that's really an interesting uh, <laughs> an interesting twist. I don't remember that part. I will explain why I say this. If you remember that movie, there's the whole thing where she, there's the wishing rock or whatever they call it. And, and it brings back Steve Trevor sort of, but it just turns, it's dumb. That part was dumb. It doesn't bring back Steve Trevor. It turns some other dude. Yeah. And she sees the other dude as Steve Trevor and the guy whose body that is, has no idea what's going on. And there's many a scene in that movie where things go on. And that poor dude, Probably wouldn't have said no to Gal Gadot. I'm pretty sure of it. Like, if he had the chance, he probably would have been like, yeah, no, I'm good. But there's not a lot of consent. is important. Not a lot of consent going on there in that movie. And so, and the wishing rock itself, that whole thing was just the dumbest. A little lazy. Yeah. I mean, that movie, there's so much bad. And then it becomes a Christmas movie at the end. You're like, oh, it's Christmas time. Where did this come from? Why is there a Christmas movie? It's a Hallmark film. Yeah, it does. It turns into a Hallmark film at the end. And it's like... She goes back to the city and she runs in and she sees him in the crowd. I'm like, this is bad. Stop it. Stop it right now. That movie is awful. And that's why we're not getting a third one because of how bad the second one was. Yeah. And I, I will, agree. That script yeah. is, is, <laughs> is you know, it's just, good. yeah, you have, you have a, a big budget, you have great actors. And so when you ultimately get to that end product, it's just baffling. Just baffling is a good word. Especially because of how great the first one was. It was such a unique yeah. thing to have a World yeah. War One movie. And 
I thought the first one was great, and I thought the follow up really was just dog shit. And then <laughs> that's no other way to put it. And then I also put on here, although I don't have much to say about it, when we talk about badly badly written movies, I cannot have a list without Jaws 3D. Right, right, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, because the first Jaws is like peak. A perfect film. Yeah, it's yeah, perfect. Wait, Tarantino put it on a film list. And then et cetera. Right. There's Same one for the Jurassic list. Park. One and et cetera. Yeah. yeah, so that those are my list of, of badly written movies. How about you, Mike? You got any bad written movies? Um, I guess another superhero one, I think Suicide Squad is like one of the first one. First. That's, that was horrible. I mean, yikes. I feel like for me, a, a movie that is boring, and I'm sitting, if I'm, I think nothing's worse when you're watching, you know, I think what Kirby, you said you see that climax that doesn't work, and all of a sudden it takes you mm-hmm. out of the film. I feel like that movie, I always added that movie like 10, 15 minutes in. I was like, this is not good. This is like a, this is a car accident in slow motion. Woo. Yeah. Um, clunky. It was clunky. It didn't flow. Uh, it's, I think it's the opposite of Batman versus Superman, whereas the production kind of saved some of the bad writing in Batman versus Superman. I think the production may have hurt any good writing that was in that movie because the original trailers we saw for that movie was not the movie that we saw. In oh, no way. Mm-hmm. Right. I put uh, two of the quick ones. I know things on Netflix aren't going to be like you know, low budget, and I kind of like something like a movie like Jaws three. Um, I even put like no the movie The Room. But I'm like those movies that be like oh it's the worst movies of all time. I'm, like I don't really consider that because these are low budget. These are right. nobodies, and we know what it is. So I, I don't but movies that have like a like an actual budget stars in it. So I saw these on Netflix. I think those I thought these were horrible because we're going to talk about do more, modern movies suck today, and these two are just. Ugh, Alona, Ilona Holmes. Uh, that's what the girl from um. Oh, eleven. Her name. Stranger yeah. Things. Yeah. Yep. And Billy Bobby Brown. Henry Cavill's in it. He's he's Sean yeah. Holmes. That movie's mm-hmm. awful. I was watching it with my fiance. We ended up turning it off half halfway. We just thought it was so boring. I couldn't. I enjoyed it. it. I could not what? get through it. Oh my I enjoyed God. it. I thought it was quirky and and good for probably like a young adult. Uh, yeah. I I was entertained. Yeah, I think we and might I, not be the target demographic, Mike, because right, well, my wife right. also well, loves talk, it. We talked sure. about this, I think, um, uh, previously. Like, I don't. It's you know, if I'm not the target audience, like a movie like we talked about Disney movies in the beginning. Like, I always loved Little Mermaid. I love Cinderella. I never thought like, well, this isn't for me. I, I just enjoyed it for what it is. Right. I'm not really like I like uh, Thirteen Going on Thirty. I like Clueless. I like Legally Blonde. I don't really. I like chick flicks. It doesn't really bother. I like the holiday, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, sometimes I think that stuff is like, oh, it's not for me. Ooh. Like, yeah, okay, I get it. But I don't know. But I, there's another movie on there, Netflix. Awful. It's called, it's this Christmas movie. It's called Happiest Season. Man, everything about that is just bad. Uh, Kristen Stewart's in it. I think it's probably one of the worst performances I've ever seen on screen. Her and the movie The Producers with, um, oh, hi, Rex. My cat's here. Um, uh, what's his name? Nathan Lane and uh, Matthew. Is it Matthew Broderick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Are we Thursday producers Thursday? you don't like? Not, no, I'm talking about the movie. The movie. The right. movie. That movie Nathan is. Nathan Lane? His, his performance in that is horrendous. Matthew, his is horrendous in that film. I, I don't know if I agree with that one. You're in the movie, I you think you like Matthew Broderick's performance in that film? I don't like I Matthew do. Broderick's performance in any movie, but I also think that The Producers is a pretty good movie. No, no, I'm talking right. about the, his performance, not the movie. I didn't say variety, I'm saying his. The acting, his acting is one of the... I mean, like, just in general, he's musical. not... musical. Yeah. Right. You well, have to be up here for a musical, right? Like, you have to sustain this, oh, uh, this top I, I mean, I, level I, I, of his, energy. But that, his, was not, his performance in that is not good. And the movie, is, this, the story and everything is amazing. That's uh, as Mel Brooks, absolutely. That movie's popping off. I'm talking about his performance in that is awful, and it's sure. one... And, uh, he did originate that on Broadway, so maybe he took that level of performance where he's playing right to the top tier uh, balcony seats and then just put it on film, and it was just too much. I, I don't know. I don't know. Matthew Broderick was not good in that movie, but um, maybe he's better on maybe he's better on in person, but I don't know. But anyway, some of these movies are just like we talked. These are just some disaster films. What, well, which Matthew gets Broderick, by the way, peaked at Ferris Bueller. So I mean, yeah, maybe movie. Lion King or Cable Guy. I like him in Cable. Yeah, Cable Guy. Oh, the Lion yeah. King. But <laughs> I think Cable Guy is. I don't really don't like. Him. I don't really like Ferris Bueller that movie to begin with that much. Oh. But, yeah. Uh, well, shot. that's a different Whoa. episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um. But folks, 
does today's movies, uh, do they just suck, or is it just me? <laughs> what? So, that's a, a loaded question. Um, I don't know if they all suck. Right, uh, right. But I think there's a difference in the way, personally, I find there are differences in the way movies are made today. And I think they're, they become very polarizing, the way they make movies. Movies used to kind of be for everyone, right? Mm-hmm. And everyone, like, kind of like you were saying before, that when I was saying maybe it's not that movie's not for us, and you were saying how you can enjoy any movie, I think they're purposely making movies now that yeah. you have to pick a side, and if you're not yeah. on the side of the movie, you're kind of like, well, I don't want to watch it, and I think it's bad, so I'm not going to watch it. They're very politicized and all the other stuff, and I think... I think that's sometimes when you watch a movie, you can interpret it as bad, even if it's not, because you don't agree with the the stance the movie's taking. And I think that makes the movies feel like they're not as good today if, you, if you're against the side the movie is taking. That's just something I think about when I watch movies now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about you, Kirby? What, what yeah, you know, we talk about... Off. You know, we talk about low attendance at theaters. You know, I sat through, I went to Oppenheimer twice and I went to Barbie twice and both were sold out like Monday night. Um, So I feel like theater has become, you know, they're pricing out really a majority of people, uh, families of four. How can you afford to go? You know, you're pricing out people. And so now the new direct to video is streaming. You know, you would, you used to go pick up the VHS or whatever went straight to video. And that didn't mean they were necessarily bad films. You just didn't want to pay the money to put them on the screen and market those. And so now that's just where we're coming to is that, you know, there's low tens in theaters because it's expensive and because it feels like you have to, you know, go out and be amongst people and, you know, they're going to cough and they're going to talk and be on their phone. You know, is it not that movies suck? Is it that, you know, audience suck a little bit? You know, I, I, I can't remember the last time I went to a movie and someone was not on their phone. Yeah, it's true. You know, our app post COVID, I feel like our respect for our fellow man has, has yes. just gone down. And you see that reflected in, in the theater, which used to be a sacred space. No talking. No looking at your phone. You don't have to multitask, but you know, if you're streaming in front of your TV, you can do whatever you like. So it's it's just changing. I don't think more movies suck. I think we have a lot more movies to choose from. Mm-hmm. And ultimately they're gonna some of them are gonna suck, you know. It's just the odds of numbers. You know, yeah. if you had 10 films released a year and two of them sucked, well, now it's 120 of them suck. So it's just a it's just a game of numbers right now. I, I feel like we still do get these fantastic, you know, lifelong loving films like Oppenheimer. I can talk about for days and days, uh, you know, just epic and timeless. Um, and then you're also still going to go see, you know, one of the. <laughs> I should have said this for worst script, but the one with uh, Pharaoh and um, Riley, they did Holmes and Watson. Mm. And oh, yeah, 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 we sat third row for that sold out theater. And I wanted to leave. I mm. wanted to stand up and leave. And I don't do that. But, you know, now our we just don't go to theaters for those films anymore. Let's wait till they stream. We already paid for it. Yeah, You know, we yep. don't have to take out a loan. You know, it's already coming out of our monthly bill. Uh, yeah, I think we're just evolving as an audience. Mm. That's an interesting point, too, when you mentioned Holmes and Watson, because that's a comedy. And uh, yeah. the guy from Pitch Perfect, um, Bumper, what's his name? Adam Devine? Devine Adam Levine. Whatever yeah. his name is. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he had a comment on a podcast. Um, Theo Vaughn's podcast the other day and I didn't think about this until he mentioned it and he said the reason comedies are dying is Marvel is killing comedy movies mm. oh, yeah, Marvel yeah, yeah. is 200 billion dollar <laughs> extravagant movies and Marvel tends to make their movies funny on top of being just action or superhero movies and you know he was, his hypothesis or theory was um, why would someone go to see a low budget comedy movie for 20 bucks if you can go and see an epic tale of a comic book adventure you know an avengers type movie that's just a giant scale 200 million dollar budget movie for the same price the audience is going to go see that instead and is that killing 
you know, the comedy movie. Mm-hmm. And let's be honest, I mean, streaming is great, but I, I don't watch that many direct-to-Netflix movies. I, I watch some of them, okay. but there's too many, so you can't watch them all. The idea of a movie coming out in the theater and only, you know, f- maybe five movies get released a week, six weeks, and you're like, well, this comedy looks like the best of the bunch. I'm going to go see it. Now, the best of the bunch is going to be an epic Oppenheimer. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to go see a small comedy. And I think he has a really great point. Yeah, I think, you know, I know a lot of people compare this to like the 70s where like there was like this changing of the guard. All of a sudden they gave all these guys like, you know, um, was it Mike Nichols and, you know, uh, no, Spielberg. Freaking, he just passed away. Um, you know, um Anybody, the Exorcist, all that kind of stuff. That whole, so maybe, hopefully, you know, with all this, what the I guess comic comic book movie burnout, you know, you have the the streaming changing, and I think now I I do think audience want some variety, you know, for sure. I think there's, I mean, you see two polar movies, Barbie and Oppenheimer, and everyone's bugging out about it. So I think studios look, they're copycats. They've been doing this since Hollywood started. You know what I mean? So I think hopefully this will start a new trend where you're going to get. Just kind of off the wall things, and I, I truly do. I know PJ, you and I spoke about like how we think it's, it's been the death of the movie star. We don't think social media has helped for sure, mm-hmm. but I do feel that you can kind of maybe re reshine that star <laughs> <laughs> if you have these variety of films. All of a sudden, like oh, I want to see the new like because uh, uh, I think he's very funny. What's his name? Uh, he played Captain America. What's his name? Oh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Evans? Chris Evans. Evans. Yeah, because I think he's a very funny actor. You know, I like him mm-hmm. in Not, Not Another Team Movie. That's a very underrated comedy. Uh, Throwback. Yeah, he was in Knives Out, the first one. Mm-hmm. But someone like him, I think he, you give him like, an, like a really good film, but a one and done film. That is, thing's going to start a whole freaking, you know, franchise. But I think you can revitalize the, um, the Hollywood uh, movie star. Maybe not as big as, you know, was years ago, but you can kind of get it back because because people always want to see the new Tarantino. It's more like mm. a director's kind of thing right now. But I think, um, you know, I know we talk about The Rock, too, I think, in the past, PJ, but he kind of has that star power. I don't yeah, really think he's in that kind of – he's in there, but he's not really there. But I think – this is kind of side note. I think he really needs to play a villain, and then he can really become the next Schwarzenegger. But he's only have that role. But anyway, mm. uh, I think there's room. But like you said, it, Kurt, I think yeah. you, you said with audiences, and that's a huge part, too. But what I also wonder if the time. Marvel movies and the DC movies have killed the idea of the movie star also because oh, the yeah. characters that they're portraying are bigger than the actors. Like, mm. you know, you could be the best actor in the world, but you probably haven't, you're not as important to the world as Batman, Superman, yeah. and Spider-Man are. Like, you know, you're an actor who's here in a moment in time, and these are characters that have been around since the 30s. They're larger than mm. life elements in pop culture. You, the character is elevating you. You're not elevating that character. And I wonder mm-hmm. if that kills the movie star vibe a little bit because you don't see them as the actor so much as now they're the character. Except Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick Boseman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was a, a fantastic actor. He didn't. I think he, that's one that's going to go down in history is uh, always having a conversation of do we ever recast Black Panther? They should have absolutely recast Black Panther the minute he went mm-hmm. cold. I don't know how else to say that. I don't want to sound. Uh, I don't want to sound heartless here. The minute that guy was gone, we should have taken a couple of days. We should have been really sad about it. We should have. We should have been there for the memorials, and then we should have threw somebody else in that cat suit real quick. Because you. Because, and again, because Black Panther is a it. He is a character that was going to be integral to the plot of these movies going forward. He was an Avenger. I mean, look how many Batmans have we have. Yeah, I get it that Michael Keaton didn't die. He stopped doing the role, but you, the world doesn't stop moving because someone died, and this is a character that he's portraying. It wasn't He wasn't being Chadwick Boseman on film. We're, we're not recasting Chadwick Boseman, yeah. right? Um, uh, what's his face? I always say who I thought would have been a great choice is, um, I can't think of his name right now, Den, Denzel's kid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. John, John Washington. I yeah. uh, he should have been the he could have been the new Black Panther. He's a fantastic mm-hmm. actor. Um, would he have had the same type of portrayal of the character? Probably not. But he's a great actor, and we could have kept going with Black Panther. I'm not saying John Washington should start going around as Chadwick Boseman because that's not a thing sure. he can do. But 
I don't think someone dying should mean we don't see a fictional character in mm. To me, that's just crazy talk. I like what they did with it. I like that Sherry became the Black Panther. I think that made total sense in the realm of that plot. All right, so Kirby, I know you want to talk about, uh, you know, the actors in writer strike. You know, I'm just kind of, you know, you know, what are your thoughts? You know, what do you think about this? Sure, sure. And I don't want to. We don't get to. We don't need to get too far into it. You know, I'm not a part of either of those organizations, but I just think it's important when we talk about writing, writing scripts, writing for film you know, writing screenplays to acknowledge that, you know, hopefully one day my coworkers are are out there striking. And, you know, I agree with what they're striking about, you know, the, you hear more about the numbers of, you know, the streaming percentages that they're getting. And it's really eye opening. (laughs) And uh, important to think about just to know that they're supported. And, You know, I keep reading different things. I keep reading that it could end tomorrow, that it will never end, that AI will take over. So I I don't have a pulse on on what's going on, but it's an interesting time to to be writing. Um, You know, I feel I haven't been promoting, you know, my scripts on my Instagram page or anything like that. Even, you know, I'm not in those organizations, but, you know, I want to stand in solidarity. So it's just an interesting time to be a creator. I feel like for the strike, I think they they are definitely doing the right thing, right? The AI and all that. People tend to think that these are millionaires fighting billionaires, but it's not mm-hmm. about that because it, this isn't the top money making people striking because they want more money. It's the writers that you know are writing these movies but can't afford their bills. It's the extras that are in the yeah. background of these movies that their likeness is, is basically being stolen and used in other areas and they're not getting paid so for crazy. it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's not the, um, it's not the, the big name actor making a billion dollars a movie. You know, it's not your Robert Downey Jr. Saying we should strike cause we want more money. That's not the reason these people are striking. I think that gets lost on people and they, they tend to see, like I said, millionaires fighting billionaires and that's not what this is about at all. Yeah. I think, right. also, I think also too, like I was, talking about earlier about like the, the changing of the guards like i said we're in this weird moment you know because you have the, the this you know these you know these folks on strike and then you have this thing right now that's kind of like it's blowing up you guys heard about the movie talk to me i think it's mm-hmm. service in theaters but basically 24 right so yeah so you have these two guys who have this youtube channel i don't know the name i forgot their names but they have like they make their own you know small films you know and they made this movie and now it's blowing up. So I, you might you might have Hollywood go, okay, instead of using these folks who are unionized, blah, 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 you get these cats who are these free agents, whatever you call these mercenaries, and all of a sudden you might have this explosion of creativity. You know, So, I mean, it's, it's a very weird, like, I don't know. It's, it could be a lot of, <laughs> like anything, unintended consequences, good ones, yeah. bad ones. So it could be quite a turning point. Kirby, were you going to say something? Yeah, I think Sorry. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no worries. I was just going to say, I think it was Mark Ruffalo who said, you know, the the place to be right now is in indie film. Yeah. You know, A24 is one of the only studios that the organizations have said can continue working because they're already meeting those standards. So I, he's got a point, you know, indie films can surge, you know, Blair Witch Project, wasn't that an indie film? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to yeah. the extreme. And it makes so much money, so it's it's something to consider. Mm-hmm. And to bring it back full circle, I started talk, the, the episode we were talking about how I like Kevin Smith and the Clerks movies. He just got an exception to film his newest movie that he's coming out with because it is going to be more of an indie production, you know. And mm-hmm. and they're letting him. I don't know what studio, or whatever it's coming out with. I, I didn't look that far into it, but I did see that he got an exception to film his movie for the same reason. The indie studio that it's coming out through already follows the guidelines and does the things that everyone's fighting for. So they're letting him do it, which, you know, maybe that's something that should be said for some of these indie, these indie companies and these indie production studios that they're doing a better job. They're, they're keeping people first, you know, something to think about for all these big conglomerates out there. Keep the people first. Mm -hmm. No one's going to see, no one's going to make you money if you, uh, if they don't want to work for you. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, Folks, we're, uh, it seems like we're running out of time out of our lunch period, and 
Um, but I just want to say, Kirby, you are a fantastic um, guest on our show. We're going to have Kirby again in the future, folks, on a future episode. Um, so stay tuned for that. So, Kirby, do you want to share any of your, you know, your plugs or anything like that where people can follow you and all that jazz? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Instagram. It's popcorny.movies. It's my username. And then I also have a website with my different uh, written works on it, and that's kirbytaylor.com. Great. Check it out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, cool kids, check out both the uh, the Instagram and the website. The Instagram has some, some very funny memes on there, and you're going to appreciate them, so definitely check them out. I also wanted to say thank you for joining us, uh, Kirby. We really appreciate you, and we're happy to have you come back on as a guest soon. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right, folks, so you know the deal. Uh, same time. Same table. Hey, cool kids. It's your pal PJ here. Hope you had a great time listening to this episode that we recorded with our guest, Kirby. We had a great time recording it. We really hope you enjoyed listening to it. Kirby's going to be back with us on September the 7th, and we're going to be talking about Lord of the Rings. Uh, There's probably going to be some lively debate about those movies, so definitely meet us at the lunch table for that episode. Next week on the 31st of August... Our friend Amy will be back. We're going to be talking about some adult-themed cartoons. That means South Park, Rick and Morty, shows like that. We hope you join us for that episode. So we'll see you around the lunch table. Make good choices, kids. We'll see you next week. Boys and girls, lunchtime is over. Please visit PJ and Mike's website, coolkidslunchtable.podbean.com, for more information. Follow the boys on all social media apps. Just search Cool Kids Lunch Table Podcast. Now get to class before you get detention.